All right. It's very exciting to be here. This is going to be a great panel, and this is a very, very important question to answer today. Uh, before I answer that question, I wanted to introduce myself uh, briefly. Uh, my name is Chris Kiefer. I'm the host of the Decouple podcast and the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. Uh, in my spare time, I practice medicine as an emergency uh, doctor in Toronto. Uh, it's Canada's or Ontario's nuclear-powered capital uh, in, in Canada. And you may be asking what a podcasting doctor uh, is doing up here on a stage with some of the titans of the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, and to be honest, so am I. <laughs> but it seems uh, there are some diehard decouple fans in the UAE. And if anyone has their phone out right now, um, I guess you're either taking pictures or you're subscribing on YouTube or uh, your podcast uh, platform of choice. <laughs> I will make that joke and get a few more uh, subscribers. So I, I really am hoping to uh, facilitate a fascinating conversation today about the challenges and opportunities we face in fueling the race. But first, again, I wanted to comment again um, on the announcement uh, to triple nuclear energy by 2050. This is my third COP. And it is truly, or would have been truly unimaginable to think that we'd be here today. Um, so a big shout out uh, to ENEC and the WNA uh, who have come together to work so hard for that outcome. Um, and why don't we give a quick round of applause. Now, as a passionate nuclear advocate um, who's been on the front lines of this public relations battle, uh, I never thought I would say that the easy part is over. Um, you know, we have an unprecedented amount of social and political license, but the hard work, I think, is just beginning. Our hosts here have brought a lot of hope, particularly to the West, with the uh, on-budget and on-time completion of the Baraka nuclear plant. But we have to be honest, the West has been struggling. To put it diplomatically, struggling to deploy nuclear reactors, and I think some of these struggles extend to the nuclear fuel cycle. We are in the moment of, of great promise, with this, this pledge to triple, great opportunity, but also of some risk. I don't want to use the F word in polite company, but failure is not an option, but it is a possibility. And if it happens, we will have no one to blame but ourselves. There are three broad challenges that I'd like to address with our panelists today in regards to our pledge to increase nuclear energy, 3x by 2050. The first, how do we scale up uranium mining? The second, how do we scale up enrichment? And the third, how do we scale up HALU and the advanced reactor fuel supply chain to deliver on the promises of advanced nuclear? In the words of today's brilliant opening speaker and the moderator of our last session, David Victor, that, that comment this morning really struck me. These challenges can be addressed, but not if we pretend that they don't exist. So with that in mind, let's dive in. I'm going to start by asking each of you uh, a challenging opening question, and then I think we'll have a bit of a, a free-for-all. So, Tim, we'll, we'll start with yourself. If I've got my numbers straight, and remember, I'm a doctor, not an engineer, and there's, there's a reason for that. We mined 50,000 tons of uranium in 2022. For every gigawatt that we add, we need another 150 tons of uranium. And so by my back of the envelope calculations, conservatively, we're going to need to have an additional 120,000 tons of uranium being produced uh, by 2050 if we are indeed going to triple nuclear energy by then. Can you talk a little bit about what that heroic effort would look like and what kind of actions are required by industry and government to achieve that? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, and thanks to Sama and Mohammed, uh, just an outstanding uh, conference and this tripling is, I've been in the business for about four decades and uh, I dreamed about this time in life and here we are. And so for those of you that are gonna keep going with it, uh, it we got, a, we got a, a good road in front of us. And so, and I'm a big fan of Decouple, uh, Chris's uh, podcast. I learned more about nuclear from that than I, uh, than I knew before. So uranium, let's talk uranium. You know, is there enough? Yes, yes there is. I think if you look at the Red Book, uh, IAEA and NEA put out together uh, 9 million tons of, of uranium uh, out there. The problem is it's underground, it needs to be on the ground, and that's where we come in. Uh, so 50,000 ton, as you say, about the consumption today, and 
if we triple by 2050, uh, then we need 150,000 uh, ton, we can do it. You have to look at where we were. The last 10 years, uh, you know, after Fukushima, the last panel talked about Fukushima, we shut down the largest high-grade mine in the world, MacArthur River. We, we put out about 18 million pounds a year, 7,500 ton a year. I mean, there was so much uranium around, the price of uranium went to $18 a pound. Nobody can mine, nobody can make money for that. We were shutting down mines. We shut down Rabbit Lake, we shut down MacArthur River, we shut down Wyoming, we shut down Nebraska. So not many years ago, we were shutting down mines because we had way too much uranium. Now the talk is, you know, we're going, we're tripling, great. We can handle it. The good news about nuclear is that we don't sneak reactors on, normally, don't sneak reactors on. <laughs> it takes us 10 years to bring a reactor on, and so we have good visibility on what the demand's going to be and, and, and how we're going to uh, have to supply that. And so we will be cautious as uh, customers uh, that are perhaps in the crowd here uh, uh, come to us and, and say, you know what, we'd like to sign a contract for 2030 to 2040, and we have lots of those customers say we need uranium from 2030. Then we know, okay, we need to have production coming on MacArthur River in Canada, maybe Cigar Lake, maybe Kazakhstan, maybe somewhere else. And so. Yes, we, uh, we will be there to supply the uranium. Uh, we need uh, the assurance that uh, we have the contracts backing us. We'll invest the money, we'll mine the uranium. Excellent, excellent. Okay, moving on to Boris. Um, I said these would be challenging questions, so you have to bear with me here. On the enrichment front, both Europe and the USA remain critically dependent on Russia for almost a quarter of their enrichment services needed to refuel the fleets. More than one in 20 American homes and businesses depend on Russian enriched uranium to keep the lights on. I got a uh, breaking news headline uh, at 5 a.m. when I was up preparing for this talk this morning. The U.S. House of Representatives has scheduled an expedited vote on a bill called Prohibiting Russian Uranium Imports Act, which would bar not only the import of yellow cake, but also Russian enrichment services. Constellation Energy CEO Joseph Dominguez has said, and I quote, the U.S. is on the verge of a crisis in conversion and enrichment. Since the trauma of the 1970s OPEC crisis, energy independence uh, is, seems to be constantly in the political discourse. What will it take for Europe and America to achieve fuel independence and deliver on that real promise of nuclear energy, which is, which is energy security? Yeah, Chris, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank um, uh, WNA and INEC for organizing all of this. It's a fantastic event. Thank you. Um, now coming back to your um, question. It's a good question, but um, I must say it's not really a problem. I, can't, I can sleep very well, I can tell you, because um, there is sufficient capacity in the market. Um, how much dependent countries want to be from other countries, that is a political decision. We are very careful of that. That's not our cup of tea. We are in the moment in the luxury situation that um, due to Fukushima, we have huge overcapacity in our, in our sector. Uh, we used them in the uh, last years actually pr to produce uranium, which was not always in favor of our colleagues from the mining side by underfeeding, so, so, so by depleting the uranium further down. And, and we are just simply in the moment reducing that, and by that we are increasing the capacity. So um, the 20% share I think that the Russians had in uh, the US, I would not call it as a dependency. Um, I would say that is a minor problem in, in, in my point of view, um, and a solvable problem, but it's a political issue. We are prepared um, as uh, Tim already said, it's at the end the customer deciding what he wants and um, it's an industry where we are normally ready before the customer is there. That is now different on this geopolitical changes. So customers want to switch from one supplier to another. It's not about um, a, a new nuclear power plant which is erected there. So, and, but it follows the similar principles of long-term contracts so that we have a reliable basis for our investments to keep a certain capacity alive or to actually in increase our capacity to certain levels which the market needs. The good thing is we are normally, especially when it comes to new build project, much faster than the nuclear reactors, so we can actually um, react before the reactors are there. 
What kind of timeline are we looking at? I understand, and again, uh, I'm the medical doctor here, but the Sapporo 5. Um, I understand there's billions of dollars of investment. I imagine because of some of the concerns I brought up, which, which you seem to be a little less concerned about, but it sounds like there's a lot of uh, resources being mobilized to, to increase capacity. And if we are to reach our, our 2050 goal here, we're certainly going to be needing a lot of capacity. So tell us a little bit more about uh, Urenco's plans. We have a capacity program in, in place. Um, we are publishing step by step the ones who have got the real final investment decision. The first project that we announced is in the US, an increase of our side there by 15%. Um, in Germany, we made an, um, a decision for capacity increase. Uh, and next ones will follow very soon. So we have a program there in place and uh, we don't publish actually numbers around them. Mm. Um, but. Uh, uh, the, the capacity will grow uh, as the demand is growing. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, challenging question number three. And I can tell you maybe one, one as sure. you are a doctor, one thing to add. We have a small niche um, business. We're also producing stable and medical isotopes. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you there the dependency um, on certain suppliers in the world is much, much higher than in our uranium side. And our investments there are in the moment um, compared to the existing business, much, much bigger. We are building really one plant after another uh, to also create a certain independence. It's good not only saving the world, but also saving lives. Um, mm -hmm. Two million people are treated by that, and I think it's a nice story around nuclear side story, uh, and, and, but very important for our day-to-day -day lives. Huh? It's a story I'm very familiar with up in Canada. Um, we produce a, a lot of medical isotopes, obviously, in our, our candy reactors. Um, okay, so moving on uh, to uh, challenging question number three uh, for Dan. Um, on the advanced fuels front, uh, it seems like we are in a halo crunch. Uh, TerraPower announced a two-year delay in the deployment of its reactors in Wyoming due to a halo shortage. <coughs> I understand the HALU cascade that came online this year will produce 900 kilograms of, of HALU. I'm told that this total yearly output would be sufficient to fuel a single 5 megawatt electric Westinghouse Evinci microreactor. We're, of course, hoping to deploy hundreds of Evinci's, of X Energy's, Oak Lowe's, Terra Powers, and many other reactor companies' uh, reactors. Um, over the next 27 years. Um, tell us about the, some of the challenges of HALU and how you uh, intend to solve those. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for the great question. Before I start, I want to thank and acknowledge the leadership of WNA and SAMA, whose vision uh, of tripling the nuclear fleet has now become a global consensus, and uh, ENEC and Mohammed <coughs> al whose project management and execution of the best program in the world would not uh, would not uh, sustain even a doubling, much less a tripling, so the success of Mohammed and his team are extraordinary. Uh, I'll get to Hayu. Just one thing, uh, just to stir things up a little bit, I have a little bit less sanguine uh, view on the LEU market than my good friend and, and colleague Boris. If you look at a couple of facts, these are WNA numbers. Global demand for enrichment, right, without Russia, is 48 million separate work units per year. And global supply without Russia is 33 million separate work units per year. 15 million separate work units per year is 100% of US demand. And add to that 10 or 11 million swim in uh, Europe. US relies for more than 20% on Russia, Europe 30%. So as Tim says, reactors don't sneak up on you, but neither do enrichment plants. So we do need, in our view, more supply, but more also more <coughs> suppliers. I just came from uh, the other Atlantic Council session. Amos Hochstein, the president's uh, energy advisor, says we can't afford to get into a situation where a single point of failure can be threatening to our energy security. Over half of our supply uh, globally comes from Russia and China. So we love what Urenco does, we love what Orono does. We need more supply, we need more suppliers, and that's why the US Congress and the US president are asking for a lot more money to, to support this. The problem extends, and I'll get to your uh, question now, to HALU very specifically. We can make, with this demonstration cascade, 900 kilograms per year. That's a tiny fraction of what my good friend Clay Sell, Chris Levesque, et cetera, need. And therefore, we need what was called for on the last panel, a public-private partnership. 
These plants cost billions of dollars to uh, invest. The United States is the only country in the world that privatized the activity of uranium enrichment because <clears throat> after it all can be used to make nuclear weapons. So we have to be thoughtful about it. It's not going to be renationalized, but how to solve the problem requires two things. Number one, we need the kind of government investment at the scale that's now being talked about in the billions of dollars which every other uh, uh, enrichment plant has uh, benefited from with their government investments at that scale. But we also need what Boris did refer to, which is that long-term demand signal. If we have those two things, a combination of a public-private partnership, the significant government investment will encourage private capital from the sidelines. You heard it from John Wagner on the last panel. And then if you get the great success we'll see from our new reactor developers, such as Clay, I'm setting him up for his uh, comments, uh, then we're gonna have the demand signal combined with the investment, and then the market will indeed produce the high assay LEU that we need. Clay. I guess two questions for you here. Do we have a chicken and an egg problem in terms of needing the HALU in order to build the reactors, but needing to build the reactors in, in order to have the, the demand for the HALU? Do you, do you think that's a, uh, a chicken and egg problem, or, or how do you approach that? <clears throat> Thank you, Chris, for the question. Let me quickly add my thanks to Mohammed and Sama for this wonderful event. Yeah, I think it's fair to call it a chicken and egg problem. Uh, you know, it, it, Boris, how long will it take you to build a halo cascade? Depends from where we start. <laughs> I, let's call it four years. And, four. Uh, and, and, and he doesn't want to build a plant until he has a firm offtake agreement for my customer Dow. My customer Dow will not make its final investment decision. They're, they're strongly committed to the project, but they won't make their final investment decision until 2026. 2026 plus four years is 2030. The reactor has to be in operation before 2030, which means I need HALU fuel before then. And so there is a, a timing difference. There's, there's no technology problem here. Mm -hmm. There's no uranium supply problem. Uh, no one can spend centrifuges better than, than, than Urenco. They have the technology to do it but there is not sufficient commercial demand for th them to make the final investment decision to expand that facility. And so what the U.S. government came up with is a program called the HALU Availability Program to cr for the U.S. government to step in and provide that long-term offtake certainty so Centris can make its investment, so Urenco can make its investment in enrichment. This problem is gonna get solved. Even as we speak, there's a $2 billion a request from the administration going through the defense supplemental in the Senate. I think it's very likely that that will be enacted uh, in the near term. And so I think the, the program and the resources are there to crack this commercial conundrum, which will allow us to see uh, HALU supplies come on to support the advanced reactor developments. Let's talk for a quick second about TRISO. Um, LEU fuel assemblies currently used in light water reactors cost around $300 per kilogram. How do we drop the price of TRISO, which, if street rumors are to be believed, is clocking in at around $10,000 per kilogram? Street rumors, by the way. Uh, for, for the manufactured price of, yeah, uh, of TRISO? Yeah. yeah. Uh, con considering the, is that with the price of HALU lo loaded in or not? So, say again, sorry. You're quoting a price for, for HALU? For TRISO. Uh, TRISO fuel, with, including the cost of, of the inputs. I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah well, I, I mean, the, the biggest driver on the cost of HALU is the uh, on the cost of TRISO fuel is the cost of the inputs. Okay. And, and so it's why we need a diversified and well-supplied set of HALU enrichers to help bring the cost down. Uh, there, the cost of TRISO fuel is more expensive than, than traditional light water fuel. We ask a lot more of it. This is a fuel that cannot melt down. It's made of ceramic material and graphite that cannot melt at any temperature that it would see in the reactor life. That changes the nature of nuclear power dramatically. It allows us to have a much smaller footprint. It allows us to take our, our fuel temperatures to a much higher uh, a level and teamed with helium as a heat transfer fluid, we can produce high temperature steam. That small footprint and high temperature steam is the very basis that Dow Chemical used to choose us 
for an industrial decarbonization effort as they will take carbon emissions at an ethylene plant in Calhoun County, Texas to zero. And so triso fuel is more expensive, but in an overall system analysis, our fuel is more expensive, we ask more of it, but that results in much lower capex in terms of concrete, in terms of steel, in terms of time to build, in terms of the number of safety related systems that have to come from a nuclear regulated supply chain, all of those benefits from the fuel help reduce the overall system costs. And we believe our high temperature gas cooled reactors will be very competitive, very competitive against firm, clean solutions that you have to choose from in the 2030 timeframe. And I'm not just talking about nuclear clean firm solutions, I'm talking about any clean firm solution. We think our XC100 reactors with TRISO fuel, with its safety case, will be exceedingly competitive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And quite frankly, we've got the customer interest to support that. Yeah, yeah. Given that LEU is the critical feedstock for HALU, um, are we putting the cart in front of the horse by focusing on, on HALU at this moment? So, as, as already was said by Dan, um, there is a chicken and egg problem to be solved for, for HALU, but I'm very optimistic that um, we are very close to the point where this um, chicken and egg problem is solved. Because there are three things ongoing. First, we see the US government strongly pushing for a solution with their RFP around a fuel bank approach, which I think helps to create an initial market on which investments can be uh, taken. Uh, secondly, we see that the UK government is also very, very strongly seeking for solutions in uh, allowing investments into this sector. And thirdly, because customers are coming much closer to the point of uh, ordering fuel. So uh, we are now in negotiations with customers and that is a different situation than three or four years ago. Um, historically, all of our investments have been market-based. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we normally don't need necessarily governments to step in. That's a very unique situation for us in the fuel cycle. So I still believe uh, the more we can do on the customer side, uh, the better it is. And all three elements together should offer us a solution in the in the in the in the coming in the coming years um, or in the coming months, I would say. And there's one element. There's one element on on the SMRs armors which is a little bit more difficult. We know very well how the generation three reactors, how that works, how the market, the electricity market works. So that um, uh, when, when, when there is an investment decision ongoing around size, well, it takes on 12 years until this uh, uh, power plant becomes reality and we, can, we have time enough to react on that. For the first of the kind of um, um, investments in SMRs and RMRs, I also believe we will have sufficient time because it follows in the beginning the same principles. But when, when the concept of SMRs, RMRs, of mass production and much faster uh, um, uh, licensing procedures should really work out, then it follows a different business logic and then we have to adapt to also a different decision-making way in the fuel industry. So we, we, we will then not see the projects necessarily, all of them be, with sufficient time before real, realization. We have to make up our decision then on other information. And that is something which is new for the industry or might be new for the industry. We don't know that yet. So that is really a challenge for the future that I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I might just add, <clears throat> I think it's important to remember the geostrategic and the geopolitical aspects of this. Tim talked about uranium prices. I remember when they were six bucks. I'm sure you do too. Uh, they're now over 80. And since the Ukraine war, even though there's no formal sanctions in place yet, either from Europe or the United States. Enrichment prices are up from the 50 to 150. Conversion prices are from 10 to 40. And therefore, to your initial question, the United States Congress and the Inflation Reduction Act invested 100, and, uh, I beg your pardon, $700 million in HALU, of which 500 million went for the product. The feedstock alone for the amount of HALU that the Department of Energy wanted, 25 metric tons times six years, is $1.8 billion. So it becomes, just as Clay was talking about in a slightly different setting, the LEU feedstock price becomes a critical and dominant factor. A million swoop of LEU feedstock is required to make the amount of 
halo that DOE wants. So we have to, I think, really think about this thing holistically. And I do think it counsels for a continued role. That's why I welcome what happened on the stage a few minutes ago of the governments. I think it's extremely meaningful that the Sapporo Five came in and talked about a meaningful, significant contribution because without that kind of government uh, ballast, I think you're gonna have continued volatility and not only the energy insecurity, but the political insecurity and the geostrategic leverage in the hands of our adversaries that we really don't wish to encourage. Chris, maybe I'll just add to the conversation if I can on the, <clears throat> we, we always uh, at Chemical were looked at, uh, oh, you're the uranium people, you supply the uranium, so. I was just gonna ask a question. Well, I that. know, yeah. It, yeah. it's true, and, and so, we see this this tripling, doubling. We've been crossing our fingers for that for a long time. And so we've been setting up for that, actually, uh, for the last 20, 30 years. And, and here it is now. And so, you know, if you go through the component parts, we've been jumping around to HALU and LEU. And if you start at the front end, you have to explore for uranium. So we explore for uranium. We have about a, a billion pounds in our portfolio that is in the ground and to be mined. So we've got some supply. Conversion, uh, we said that's that's been a poor cousin for the last 25 years. You never made money on conversion. <clears throat> now we're tight. And so we've increased our conversion capacity. Yep, we have a, port, a facility in Port Hope, Ontario, that we're increasing the production. We're not out of the, uh, we're not advanced like these uh, these folks on the, uh, on the enrichment side, but we've uh, invested about half a billion dollars into global laser enrichment in Wilmington, North Carolina. We think that's got hope for the future, and hopefully we'll be alongside these folks at some point. We have a deal with the DOE, uh, Dr. Huff, and, and folks to re-enrich some of the uh, tails, depleted tails, that are sitting at Portsmouth and Paducah. And then two weeks ago, we, we decided we should even go further down the line, and we put all of our chips that we had in the middle of the poker table and, and bought a company called Westinghouse <laughs> with a partner uh, named Brookfield. And so we're all in. We're all in nuclear. We believe in this. We believe in, in what Clay's doing down there and, and Boris and, and Dan. And these are all friends for a long time. We're all getting ready for it and we, we'll be there. It's going to be tricky because in our business, you're either through the roof or at the bottom, it seems. And so it's hard to adjust to that. Yeah. I can tell you in the 2000s, from 2000 to 2011, we were scrambling uh, like crazy. To, you know, somebody mentioned how many reactors were going to be built and and so we were trying to get the fuel all of a sudden 2011 to 2021 off the table, shutting everything down. Now here we go, whoa, let's go again. So it's not like McDonald's where you, you, know, you try and grow your revenue line by 2% every year. We're either up here or down here. Now we have to get going. But I, I'm completely convinced and confident that we can do it. Yeah. I'd like to just add a very quick point on that. This tripling, it's, it's no small thing, right? And yes, we are competitors. But you know what? That's a good thing. What that means is diversity of supply. I want Uranium to succeed. I want Orono to succeed. Uh, I hope they want us to succeed because we need that diversified sources of HALU and LU to provide not just stability of supply, not just security of supply, but the price competition so that Clay and Chris Levesque, when they go out to put fuel out to bid, they've got a number of suppliers who can step up to the plate and guarantee a robust, resilient, multiply supplied, competitively priced market. So Tim, just, just back to you for a second. Um, you, you kind of uh, stole my thunder. Um, chemicals, I think, undergone a pretty uh, remarkable transformation into this really vertically oriented um, entity, uh, as you're mentioning, all of the different services that, that you now supply. Um, could you have imagined that uh, 10 or 15 years ago? And also, what role do you see moving forward in terms of, you already manufacture can-do fuel through Westinghouse to be manufacturing LEU fuel. What does the future hold in that regard in terms of being the full package as a company? Yeah, <clears throat> so, you know, I've been around long enough. I've seen the movie. I started, uh, uh, my first job was in 1979, just after Dan started probably. Uh, but uh, that, you'll remember that was Three Mile Island, so whoop, here we go, and then off the cliff we went. 86 was uh, another one. I know we hate talking about them, but they had an effect uh, on our business. I can tell you, we went through 10 tough years in the, in the 2010s, but then I'd say about two or three years ago, we could feel the winds of change blowing. You know, all this talk about climate change and decarbonization, electrification, race to net zero, climate change, climate crisis, climate catastrophe, and we said, wow, th this, and you could feel nuclear was getting some steam behind it again. And, and so we started looking and saying, how, we do, how do we want to position 
ourselves with this. And, and, and then, you know, that all got surpassed by energy security for a lot of different reasons. People became worried about energy security. And then, you know, this phrase, we, I've heard it five times today, uh, you know, there's, there is no net zero, I mean, that's a, <laughs> there's no net zero without nuclear. <clears throat> and so we said, we're nuclear, we're only nuclear, what are we gonna do? And so we started looking back at our minds again, we restarted some of our minds uh, as our customers wanted to aim. We increased our production uh, and then uh, Westinghouse came available and we, uh, we looked at it and <clears throat> we said, uh, it's now or never, we're gonna go now or never because a lot of our business, 80% is government owned and government controlled, we're not. We're on the Toronto Stock Exchange, we're on the New York Stock Exchange. That's an independent asset that came available and we said, are we all in? And we kind of put our hands in and, uh, and said, let's go and, and we took that. And so, you know, our goal is to be a full service uh, company uh, with a, an alternate supplier to the others that are out there. I think our time, we made that deal a year ago, it took us a year to close it, but I think uh, the, uh, the environment looks even better today than when we made the deal and we just want to be there for our customers. Uh, you know, we've, <clears throat> through the uranium and conversion, we have, I don't think there's a <clears throat> utility in the world that we haven't supplied uranium to at one point or another. And so this brings us uh, some added, uh, some added activities that we can, uh, we can add to our customer base. So yeah, we just want to be out there. We want to be part of, we're proud to be nuclear. We're a pure nuclear company and, and we're really proud. And today we can walk around with our heads really high because, uh, you know, we're doing a good thing for the world. So not to shine too much of a spotlight on you, but just this has been such a geopolitical conversation for obvious <clears throat> reasons, but could you just take a very brief moment to discuss the deal with uh, Ukraine to supply fuel uh, uh, to the Ukrainian fleet? Yeah, so uh, you obviously we're aware of what happened uh, last year, February 24th, and uh, you know, we'd been working with the Ukraine a bit before they were looking to diversify their fuel supply, I think after 2014, and so they started looking at who could fabricate uh, fuel for VVRs, and so that was Westinghouse. So that was before us, of course. But then uh, they came uh, to us uh, about six or seven months ago, uh, the, the Minister Heloshenko and, uh, and, and, and Petro Koten, some of you will know them, and, and said, we'd like to diversify our fuel supply and, and could you supply all of it? And honestly, we had to think about it because there were some of our shareholders that said, are you sure you want to do that? That's, uh, there's a risk. And, <clears throat> and we, you know, we, we, we talked about it and we said, uh, yeah, they have... So they have 15 reactors, uh, nine of them uh, they're operating today and six of the Zaporizhia that, uh, that aren't operating. But we said, we'll supply all your fuel uh, for the next, till 2035. Uh, that's uh, uranium and conversion. Uh, Boris can speak about it because uh, he's uh, partners <laughs> with us in, in, in the piece. And, and so, you, you know what, sometimes you just have to kind of do the right thing too. And, and so uh, there's some risk to us and if it goes the wrong way, then I guess uh, that's on us, but uh, we're, we're very proud to be part of that. And I can tell you, where I live, uh, in Saskatchewan, there's about 30% of the population is of Ukrainian descent, yeah. as you'll know, Dr. Kiever. And so, uh, you know, our employees were proud to step up. And, and we've helped not only with the fuel, but we've sent uh, other supplies to help, uh, help them out uh, mm -hmm. in, in their time of need. So. Clay, I want to want to bring it back to you. Um, your company is well known, obviously, for the reactor side, but also I believe there's a Triso X facility um, that's in the works uh, at Oak Ridges. Am I getting that right? O Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, USA. Do you want to take a moment to sort of explain progress there and and what what the vision is? Well, certainly our vision is to bring uh, the XC100 reactor, pebble bed reactor, to the marketplace in a very large way. And when we designed that vision, there was not a commercial supplier of TRISO fuel because, quite frankly, there was not commercial demand for, for, for TRISO fuel. Uh, we saw an opportunity uh, to grow a new and different part of our business. Uh, we were uh, extraordinarily fortunate to win a major government grant from the U.S government in 2015 to redesign how to make triso fuel to do it in a way that produced higher quality, less waste streams, more efficient ways to uh, 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 recycle the uranium. We proved that out in a pilot facility and, uh, and so we're really proud of the role that, that, uh, that we're planning to bring the advanced fuel manufacturing business to fruition. Uh, we are in construction on an advanced fuel facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. 
It will be the first new fuel manufacturing facility in the U.S. in approximately 40 years. It's, uh, we, we can make all types of encapsulated fuels, not just for X and e, X, uh, X energy uh, uh, reactors, but for any other reactor that uses encapsulated fuels. And, and you know, uh, uh, USNC uses encapsulated fuels, Kairos uses encapsulated fuels, the Department of Defense <clears throat> and NASA in their space and, and micromobile reactors use triso fuel because of its robust safety characteristics. So we really see a growing uh, market opportunity. When we seized it, we went to the department and we hired really one of their leading uh, fuel guys, uh, Pete Papano, to, to help build the Triso X uh, fuel company. And we're, we're really proud of the progress that we've made. It's, a, it's an important part of our business on a go forward basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess on the, uh, on the topic again, getting back to uh, the geopolitics, which are again, <laughs> messy. Um, there is this legislation in front of Congress um, the Europeans uh, maybe were caught with their pants down when it came to, uh, to the, the gas cutoff uh, in Europe. Um, it seems like there's nothing to preempt uh, Mr. Putin potentially saying, I'm going to beat you to the punchline or I'm not going to let you decide when, when you ban you know, imported SWU from, from Russia. Um, it seems like this could come like it's quite a shock or quite suddenly. Um, our it, enrichers in, in the U.S. and the relationships with enrichers in Europe are ready to, to deal with that? Question to me. I guess, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, once again, it's a political decision. Um, of course, there are discussions maybe to correct one number. Um, when you have a nameplate capacity on an enrichment plant, in our case it's 18 million SWU, that's a nameplate capacity, but we can produce much more SWU in it when it's needed, but then we need more feed. Uh, by so-called overfeeding, but changing the operation. So we have roughly an, an plus minus even more than 5%. It can be um, up to 10%, uh, sorry, 20%, 20% range around that point. So plus minus 5 um, million SWU. Um, uh, so that's the flexibility that we have in an existing fleet. So that's why I'm a little bit relaxed on the enrichment side. I think in, the, in, the, in, the, in this geopolitical debate, the conversion side is in the moment in the Western world the more um, tight uh, area. Um, I'm very happy that Convertine in the US is uh, back online and uh, producing, and um, uh, that is something where we need to prepare for. Uh, but on the enrichment side, I would say I would not worry too much. Um, but once again, I think the industry should not have a very strong position on this. These are political decisions that are societies who need to decide what they want. As an industry leader, I can only say, well, we need guidance, political guidance. We need clarity. What, does, what do societies want from us? And that needs to be translated in a long-term contract. So we are not an insurance there, short-term insurance for customers. We can't be. We can't now double our capacity on short term and then we have huge overcapacities that will not work. So what, what, what actually the, 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 the expectation is that we have uh, on, on politics and the US is working on that, I, I, I know, to give guidance to the market, what is the expectation of the government, what is the expectation of the society, what the industry should deliver. And um, I would also expect the same from other parts of the world, um, that is what we are needing, at least from the bigger markets. Otherwise, it will be difficult for us to make our investment decisions. Um, but I must say, um, at least in certain parts of the world, I have seen also a reaction by the customers itself without any political guidance. Uh, there are customers who have decided uh, to terminate existing contracts and to move uh, over. We have just yeah, talked about the Ukraine for sure, but there are other ones in the Scandinavian countries who um, have taken similar decisions. And uh, so our observation at least, I can't talk about individual customers, but our observation is that customers make up their own mind what they think is right or what is wrong and what they want from us. And as long as we get these signals, um, we are able to react on them. And with overfeeding, can you react quickly? Or quickly enough, do you feel? 
Yeah, we can react very quickly and I can promise you when, when it's needed, we are very fast and we will send them very fast, clear signals to the markets. But I must say, we all remember very well in 2014 when we had huge overcapacities and we should not forget that. We were all in a situation. We had a new site, a brand new site in the US. We had to uh, impair and write it off. Um, uh, 1.5 uh, 1.4 billion impairments uh, uh, shortly after the investment. That's not something that you like um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a business. So I, I would like to avoid that we come back into such a situation. So that's why we are careful. We make these decisions where we have clear indication that we make, of course, sure all customers who want to buy fuel from us will be will get offers from us and will get fuel. Uh, so that is uh, for sure. We, we, we are there and I think we have a, a, a name of 53 years, never missed a delivery at Orenco. So um, that is a long history. We are normally, not normally, we, have, we are always fulfilling what we are promising. That's where we are coming from. Um, so that's... Mm -hmm. And in terms of the volatility of the market, uh, this is maybe a humorous aside or, or not humorous, but I, I do hear there's a lot of centrifuges buried in the desert somewhere. Um, but Dan, did you want to uh, to jump in? Yeah, you, you offered uh, an invitation for an American and a European uh, perspective. American perspective, again, is a little less sanguine. Uh, these parts of the market all interact. It's like squeezing a balloon. So if you go more into overfitting, it's going to put more pressure on conversion, which is already at $45. That goes north. and it, it runs through the system. We need more supply. We need more, more suppliers. That's why the Sapporo 5 did what they did, right? And I've said publicly many times, it takes us 42 months to build a cascade. To your original question, if Mr. Putin decides to do something like on next Wednesday instead of on a different timeline, it's going to be challenging. I'm not, I'm not saying uh, overfeeding can't do some of the work, but I think... <clears throat> I think the prudent long-term policy perspective, market perspective, security perspective says we need more supply and we need uh, more suppliers. And I think we'll be more robust and we'll be less uh, vulnerable. It's just like natural gas. It's just like semiconductors. It's just like COVID. We learned bitter lessons when we have a non-resilient, uh, non-diversified supply chain, people end up suffering. So we've been talking probably a little bit too much about the present and, and uh, the nasty situation of uh, this new world order that we're in. Let's spend the last two minutes and 26 seconds. I'd just like to go through the panel um, and again, talking aspirationally about what we're trying to achieve by 2050, um, what each of you feels um, is a challenge and an opportunity moving forward. Let's start with you, Clay. Well, I think the opportunity is to go well beyond 3x today's installed capacity for nuclear. And I think that opportunity is going to be driven by an absolute change in the nature of the electricity market in the West and particularly in the United States. Whereas before we've looked for leadership from the utilities, in the future I think leadership is going to come from industrials and, and other large users like data centers, which will transform the nature of project development in, in the U.S. When you add the industrial piece into what is already being assumed will come from electrification, I think you're gonna see a much larger uh, uh, in increase in nuclear. And you know what, we can do it. The US did it in the 70s, France did it in the 80s. We've seen patterns of dramatic expansion, multiple gigawatts coming on a year, and, and we're, gonna have, we're gonna be called upon to do that yet again at even a, a greater rate, but I'm confident we can do it. Beautiful. Go ahead, Boris. Tripling the nuclear capacity um, is a huge challenge. And it's a fantastic story. I think it's an ambition which is really, really um, good. How realistic is it? When you look at the history of France, I would say it's realistic. When you just uh, take the 30 years when they took their decision for um, nuclear in the 70s or end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, 65 gigawatt 27 years later were installed. So when we replicate that in the Western world, it would easily lead to the tripling. So it's possible. We have already um, a benchmark. It's an exciting story for us as an industry. I think it needs certain things. One of the things that I have in mind is collaboration, cooperation. Collaboration, cooperation between nations. And we see that. 
just as an example, the UK-US partnership on nuclear is a very strong one where things are done together. We have seen the five leaders here, the G7 leaders, five of the G7 leaders here together on the fuel cycle signing or this declaration, strong signals, um, but also cooperation within the industry. And um, uh, Tim has mentioned, the, as an example, yeah, after the Ukraine war, we were, um, Chemico, Westinghouse and us, within days able to actually offer um, an alternative and a solution for, for, for them. And that, is a, that was, for me, a very strong and good example of collaboration in the industry. Um, this whole challenge is too big that we can all try to make everything alone. We have to collaborate, we have to do things together, and we are used to that. And I believe it's a, it's a, it's a challenge, but it's achievable. And uh, that's why it's, it is exciting to be in this area and to support this development. Gentlemen, we are on budget, but slightly over time. I do want to hear your perspectives, but we'll have to I'll do it quick. in 30 begin, seconds or less. I will begin on a point of agreement with my good friend Boris on the need for collaboration, which is kind of a setup for Tim to talk about his North American solution to the front end of the fuel cycle. In terms of aspirations to support the tripling by 2050, I would like to see the world move from four to five enrichers of uranium, the fifth one being in the United States of America, which had in 1985 27 million separate work units of production capacity. I think that's a good number to shoot for. Tim, go ahead. Chris, I agree with everything they said, so I won't repeat that. Two things. One, I hope in 2050 the panel doesn't look like this. It's a little bit more diverse uh, than this going forward. We need. We need to diversify and include a lot more people. We are going to need mountains of workers, and I hope uh, we can diversify and, and really attract a lot of people. Last thing, and I know we're way out of time, can I recognize Dan Poneman? Uh, Dan Poneman uh, has put about four and a half decades into this business, and I think uh, Dan's retiring soon. Is that public, or is yes, it all good? Uh, <laughs> so Dan's, about, uh, he's been a good friend, so. All right, everybody, that's a wrap. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, gentlemen.